Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Melanie Ionese. I am the Physician Relations Specialist here at Rothman. Tonight, you'll be hearing Dr. Tulipin speak on common hand issues, understanding carpal and cubital syndrome. Just a quick few housekeeping notes. This lecture is being recorded and you will receive it in an email within about seven days. Also during the lecture, there is a Q&A icon where you can ask questions throughout the lecture. And at the end, we will have enough time to answer as many as we possibly can. And if we don't, I will leave my email in the chat box. So feel free to ask Dr. Tulipin any questions that were not answered and we will get back to you in a timely manner. And also we'll be leaving the Rothman 1-800-321-9999 if anyone's interested in making an appointment with Rothman. Without further delay, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jay Tulipin, orthopedic hand surgeon here at Rothman. Dr. Tulipin, thank you for giving us your time this evening and take it away. All right. Um, well, nice to meet you all. I'm Jake Tulipan. I'm uh, one of the two hand surgeons at the Rothman Group um, that's based down in Egg Harbor Township here. Uh, myself and my partner, Brian Hozak, cover the ER at Atlantic Care, um, that's mainland and city. Um, and then we see patients in the office down in Cape May Courthouse here and up in uh, Manahawk. And, um, so the thing I probably get asked about the most, probably the most common thing that I see in the office is carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, it's something that has a lot of myths surrounding it uh, and also a lot of truth surrounding it. Um, there are a lot of people who've dealt with this, a lot of people who know a family member, a friend who, who's had it. <laughs> and it's something where the treatment has evolved a little bit over the last few years. Um, so I just think it's an interesting topic to talk about. It, it takes up a huge part of my life in terms of thinking about it, treating it. Um, it's a big portion of the surgeries that I do. Uh, and I'm always uh, interested to talk about kind of the newer developments in it and the things that we do differently than what was done maybe 10, 15 years ago. Uh, so this is a picture of the hand um, to talk a little bit about what carpal tunnel syndrome actually is. On the left side, we see what the hand looks like um, with just the skin removed. You can see all those tough fibrous connective tissues that make the skin in your hand so much more durable than the skin elsewhere in your body. Uh, and if you look on the right side, we see what it looks like under those fibrous tissues into the more detailed nerves and blood vessels and tendons in the hand. The yellow um, in this drawing here is all nerves. And if you look, you can see one nerve right there going through the center called the median nerve. And you can see that it seems to dive underneath this bridge or a tunnel, um, kind of like a highway moving underneath the highway overpass. And that median nerve diving underneath that transverse um, tough band of tissue, which is called the transverse carpal ligament, is the actual carpal tunnel, the tunnels that underpass that the nerve dives through. Um, you have a, several major nerves that go to your hand. Um, the ones that we're most concerned about are the ulnar and the median nerve. The median nerve um, has functions that are involving motion and functions that are involving sensation. And the ulnar nerve has the same. The median nerve is the one that branches in your hand and goes to your thumb, index, middle, and ring finger. The ulnar nerve is your funny bone nerve. That's the one that goes to your little finger, and it's why your little finger tingles when you hit your funny bone. Um, in addition to that, you have some fine muscles in your hand, the muscles at the base of your thumb, the muscles on the side of your hand, and the muscles that are actually in between the fingers that help all the fine motor skills like typing and using a knife and fork, writing, things like that. Um, and some of those muscles are controlled by the median nerve and some are controlled by the ulnar nerve. The median nerve, the one that we're talking about for carpal tunnel syndrome, controls mainly the muscles at the base of your thumb, which are the ones that you use to make an okay sign or to bring your thumb across to touch the tip of your little finger. These are the areas that are given sensation by each of those nerves. The median nerve is all in pink here. You can see that it provides sensation to your thumb and your index finger. So all the pinching sensation that you have, all the sensation you feel holding a pen to write, and also onto the back of those fingers a little bit. And this again is a look at the carpal tunnel. This is the muscles in that soft tissue. And if we look right at the center, at the base of the palm there is that tunnel that we're talking about with what you can see is called the transverse carpal ligament lying right there. And that tunnel underneath composes um, an area for the tendons and the nerve to pass through. So as the median nerve passes from the form into the hand, you can see it here in yellow on the left side, um, it passes under that tight space. 
uh, it's formed essentially like a little ravine. The bones that actually make up the wrist, if you look at them in cross sections, which we see on the right, it forms essentially a little ditch. And the top of that ditch is roofed over by that transverse carpal ligament. So the nerve is actually sitting inside a, a little culvert, um, almost a pipe that's bone on each side, bone on the bottom, but the very top is this tough, tufted band of tissue. Um, we don't really know what the transverse carpal ligament is there for. A lot of people think it's a vestigial structure. Some think it's there maybe to provide some extra protection for the structures inside. The honest truth is that people seem to do just fine without one, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, the issue is that the median nerve doesn't have that tunnel all to itself. So you are a, a couple other things moving within it. All nine of the tendons that flex the fingers and the thumb travel through that tunnel as well. And you can see those in, as these blue ovals traveling with that yellow nerve. The tendons are tough and flexible tissue. They're strong enough that a rock climber can hang by just one of those tendons uh, when they're hanging by a finger while they're climbing. Um, and they're not really stretchy. Uh, they don't have any give, essentially. The transcarpal ligament is the same way. It's this very tough band of fibrous connective tissue. And then everything else surrounding that tunnel is all bone. So as everything swells or thickens in that area and the pressure increases in the tunnel from all of the things getting larger and larger, something eventually has to give. And what's gonna give is that soft squishy structure that's in there and that's the median nerve. So unfortunately, uh, the median nerve does not take well to being squished like that. And as it gets pinched, it starts to malfunction. And when the median nerve malfunctions, malfunctions from that pinching, that's what we call carpal tunnel syndrome. So nerves are made up of cells that carry electrical signals. And those signals um, are the signals that our brain interprets as sensation. Um, everything from temperature sensation, pain sensation, pressure sensation. Uh, and the cells themselves to help carry those electrical signals have a second set of cells surrounding them that forms insulation. The same way you have wires in your house that are made of copper wiring to carry the signal and rubber insulation to surround them. Uh, as the nerve gets pressed on, it starts to malfunction. Um, the insulating cells are the first thing to get damaged. The signals get degraded the same way the lights will flicker in a house with bad wiring that has poor insulation. Um, we sense that uh, degraded signal of electrical signal from those nerves as numbness, tingling, burning, or electric shock type sensations. It's something everybody feels if you sit on your leg for too long. The pressure on the nerves that go down to your leg are what give you the pins and needles in your foot. Um, in other people, those same symptoms can appear as burning, tight pain, or even uh, a deep and aching discomfort. Um, and ultimately, uh, if things continue to go on, um, you can actually start to feel some weakness. The issue is that um, the weakness is coming from problems conducting nerve signals in the opposite direction. So not only do those nerves travel from your fingertips all the way up to your brain to give you sensation, but other sets of, of cells in that same nerve go in the opposite direction. And they're what travel from your brain down to the muscles and allow your brain to tell your muscles to fire. And just like your signals that control your sensation can become altered, um, the signals that tell your muscles to fire become altered. And we feel that as either twitching of the muscle or more likely as weakness. And once you start to feel weakness there, it's a sign that the symptoms become more and more severe to the point that so little signal is getting through the muscle that the muscle is not able to function normally. This is my helpful little illustration to think of what's actually going on inside the nerve during this compression. Um, again, you can think of the nerve as a bundle of insulated cables. And just like a nerve, uh, or just like an animal that was gnawing at the wires, the continued pressure over time is causing that insulation to break down. And eventually, without insulation, those signals can't be cell norm, uh, sent normally. Um, the issue is that those cells have a hard time healing. Um, the insulation cells, which are called myelin, uh, have quite a bit of trouble healing, although they do still have some healing potential. The cells that actually make up the wires, which are called axons, the nerve cells themselves that come from your spinal cord and go all the way down to your fingertip, those are exceptionally difficult to get to heal. Um, they're some of the longest cells in your body. And so if you do manage to have those completely interrupted or severed, that long 
microscopically thin tendril of nerve cell has to regrow its way all the way down past the area it was injured and all the way back out to the fingertip. And as you can imagine, a cell, a tiny little microscopic cell has a great deal of difficulty growing over a length of inches or even feet, which you can get after a nerve injury like this. We talked about the muscle a little bit. When carpal tunnel syndrome gets very severe, those muscles, which are used to always having a little bit of electrical stimulation, um, start to atrophy. And your body doesn't want to spend all the energy it takes to keep maintaining a muscle that's never going to fire. And eventually, after a while, your body will get the idea that this muscle is never going to be used again. And it starts to turn that muscle into fat or to eat it away. And that causes muscle atrophy. And this is what bad carpal tunnel syndrome looks like. You can see on this picture, this person's thear muscles, that is the muscles at the base of their palm, have actually started to degrade to the point that instead of having a bulge like is normal there, they've started to get a dent in that area. Once it gets to this point, the muscle, if you actually were to go in and look at it, or if you were to look at it on an MRI, you'd see has actually turned into fat. Once we get here, even if we are able to do surgery or we're able to restore the nerve function going to that muscle, we can't turn the muscle from fat back into muscle again. And this is the point where carpal tunnel syndrome becomes impossible to fully recover from. Our whole goal in treating carpal tunnel syndrome is generally to try to avoid getting to this point. We have some tricks that we can play, some things that we can do to give us strength back and get to the thumb functioning more normally if it gets here, um, but none of them are quite as good as preventing it from happening in the first place. So what do we actually do about this pressure? And we have three things that we can do for carpal tunnel syndrome. We can do bracing, we can do steroids, we can do surgery. The first line of treatment here is bracing. Um, the bracing is usually used for mild carpal tunnel syndrome. This is an Amazon um, search for one of the carpal tunnel braces. And you can see there are over 2000 different ones for sale on Amazon. Um, the braces are put on at night. And the reason for that is almost everybody, whether they realize it or not, sleeps in a fetal position and curls their wrists in front of them. And as you curl your wrist, if you go back and you remember what that carpal ligament looks like, you can imagine that with a bent wrist, the nerve right where it's entering that tunnel is getting kinked. And that puts a pressure point with significantly more pressure on the nerve right there, tends to make the symptoms worse. That's why everybody who has carpal tunnel, or at least most people have carpal tunnel, says that it's worse at night. They say they wake up, they feel like they need to shake their hands out or like they're falling asleep as they're asleep. Um, the wrists do nothing more than just keeping the wrist, uh, the braces rather, do nothing more than just keeping the wrist straight. Um, you wear them at night, uh, it stops you from bending that wrist, whether you're realizing it or not, and it keeps that area where the nerve enters the carpal tunnel a little bit more open, makes the symptoms a little bit less severe. For people with mild symptoms who aren't at risk of losing anything permanently, like we talked about that permanent muscle loss, this is a really good option to help them sleep better. Unfortunately, you can't wear them during the day. You can imagine what it's like to try to use a mouse or turn a doorknob or drive with one of these braces on because they have a hard plastic slab in the front. And so it's just too much of an inconvenience to wear them at daytime. Next option is a steroid injection. Uh, so steroids like cortisone, prednisone, other things like that are powerful anti-inflammatory. And we inject them right into the carpal tunnel to help reduce the swelling of inflamed tissues. And if you remember, all those other tissues traveling with the nerve, all these tendons that we see here in cross section, can often get a little bit inflamed, which causes them to swell. And that's part of what puts the pressure on the nerve. All the steroid injection is doing is helping bring down some of that swelling to reduce the amount of stuff that needs to move through the carpal tunnel uh, and puts pressure on the nerve there. It's not usually a permanent fix because the steroid's a medicine. And so it's gonna wear off eventually. And steroids do have side effects. They can cause um, weakening of the tendons. If you can get them over and over, it can cause some thinning of the skin. Um, they have some side effects generally in your system as well. And so we don't like to do steroid injections over and over and over, but in short-term periods, this can provide some relief um, in people who, uh, good examples I've had are people who have been about to take a vacation and they just can't get surgery done right now. They need something to get them through for the next month or two. Um, those are great candidates for steroid injections. They're also really helpful for diagnosis. A person who has symptoms that they seems like are carpal tunnel, but maybe aren't quite characteristic, a carpal tunnel steroid injection can tell us whether or not it gets better. And if it does get better, it tells us that the issue was going on within the carpal tunnel. Um, 
like I said, there are some issues with this. Uh, there are some problems with using them in people with diabetes because all steroids will raise blood sugar in people with diabetes. Um, there's a risk with any injection, especially when you're injecting your nerve, that the tissues could be damaged. And the last thing we would want to do is put a needle into that nerve. You can imagine how much that would hurt. Um, and finally, uh, because the steroid uh, reduces the immune response, there is a risk of an infection after you give an injection. Um, it's very, very low for the injection itself, but it means that we can't do any surgery for three months after the injection in that area because of the risk of problems with the wound infections. So the final option and the mainstay of treatment for surgery is carpal tunnel, or for carpal tunnel rather, is surgery. Uh, and the surgery we do is called the carpal tunnel release. The nice thing about the surgery is that once we release that transverse carpal ligament, the two sides of the ligament where we've cut it spring open, Eventually, over time, they'll slowly heal back together, but they heal together in an elongated position, and they don't put that same kind of pressure on the nerve. And so the surgery is, in the vast, vast majority of people, a permanent fix. Um, it's one of the most common, I think, believe it's the second most common surgery done in the entire United States um, after only cataract surgery. Uh, we do over 400,000 of them a year in the United States alone. Uh, and the surgery has been essentially unchanged since it was first described in 1924. Um, the only thing that's really changed in that time is that every year the incisions get a little bit smaller. Uh, it used to be that the cut would be from all the way in the forearm up into the middle of the hand, and now the incision is about as big as the one that you see drawn out here. The surgery itself is very safe. Um, it's performed by making a little cut there. Uh, going through some of the fat underneath the skin until we get down to that transverse carpal ligament, and then just making a slit in the ligament along its entire length. Like I said, the ligament, which is under a little bit of tension, just springs open. Right underneath, we're looking at the nerve. You make sure the nerve looks good, and then close everything up with a few little stitches in that wound. Has a very, very low risk of complications, um, about 1%, and those risks are infection, damage to the nerve, um, issues with healing of the wound. It's actually one of the safest surgeries that's done. Um, even that risk of complications, the vast majority of those are extremely minor. Uh, the only issue is that the nerve, uh, the surgery itself doesn't actually fix those individual cells within the nerve. Um, the surgery is just taking the pressure off to stop the nerve from getting damaged. And it relies on your body's ability to heal the nerve injury afterwards. That means that in those people with very severe carpal tunnel syndrome, who've already had damage where the cells of the nerve have died off, um, the surgery won't fix that. It will stop it from getting worse, um, but there are many people who have the surgery done and they'll have some improvement in the numbness and tingling in their fingertip, but it won't go away completely. They may still have some numbness, some tingling. Um, and the people who've developed weakness, while they may get some innervation back to those muscles, those muscles may start to function a little bit better, they may not get completely normal muscle function back. For that reason, we always like to try to get to that surgery before it gets to the point of permanent damage. And there are a couple of things that govern that. One is how severe the damage to the nerve is, and we do something called a nerve conduction study to test for that. The other things have to do with a person's general health, um, things that affect the whole body, affect the nerve as well. Um, so issues like smoking, um, diabetes, both decrease the ability of the nerve to heal. The nerve becomes less able to heal the older we get. So a carpal tunnel release that works very well and maybe a 35, 40 year old will still work in a 50 or 60 year old, but might take longer to heal and then might not be 100% successful in a 70, 80 or 90 year old. That being said, it's still something we would do in that 70, 80, or 90 year old because we don't want them to get worse and end up in a point where they don't have any functioning muscles or ability to use their hand. So there are a couple of very cool things that have happened in hand surgery in the last decade or two, especially with regards to carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, back in the very old days, in the 1920s, and even all the way up to the 60s, 70s, this surgery actually used to be done under general anesthesia. There was even a time when people were admitted to the hospital for this, um, which to a modern surgeon sounds like insanity. Um, over time, that transition, and we started just sedating people and giving them local anesthesia during the surgery. Um, and then even more recently than that, people have started actually doing these wide awake. Uh, I do 99% of my carpal tunnel surgery wide awake at this point, and there are a couple reasons for that. 
Um, one, it avoids any of the preoperative testing. Two, it avoids any of the issues with anesthesia. People don't get nauseous. People can eat before surgery. People can drive themselves to and from the operating room. You don't need a ride. You don't need any blood testing beforehand. Um, and it gets people in and out of the surgery center much faster because they don't have to wait to get put to sleep and then wait to wake up afterwards. It tends to be a much better experience for patients. Um, and it's nice to, to um, be able to tell people what you're doing as you do it and for people to understand exactly what's going on as it's happening. That being said, we don't do it like this is in this picture. Um, my personal preference is that we put a curtain up. Uh, a lot of people don't like to see the wound. Um, but it's not actually that dissimilar. Uh, I've done this to people, uh, the surgery with people on their lunch breaks and their street clothes, although we generally um, don't do it quite like that at our surgery center. Uh, and the surgery only takes about five to 10 minutes. And so people can get this done and go back about their normal life. Um, the way it's done is with numbing medication um, that we inject right into the area of the surgery or well, along with some epinephrine, which is a medication that'll help constrict blood vessels in the area so that the medication makes you number for longer. It's the exact same mixture that dentists use when they're um, doing a filling and it works exactly the same way. Um, the other uh, nice thing is that, you know, we can sit, we don't have to worry about us having instruments in your mouth like you're a dentist. So when I ask you questions, you can actually respond, which is always nice. Um, the people who I do the surgery for generally prefer to have it done awake, even though there's always obviously some anxiety with having surgery awake if you've never had it before. Uh, I think as the years go by, we're going to move more and more towards doing wide awake surgery like this because it just works so well for patients. It's so safe. Um, it means that you don't have to worry about any of those side effects of anesthesia that some people find so uncomfortable. It does a really good job of controlling pain. The hand is totally numb during the surgery and it stays numb for long enough afterwards that really that first period um, is quite comfortable for a good six, eight hours after you're finished. The other exciting thing that's happened with carpal tunnel syndrome is that we've developed endoscopic carpal tunnel releases. Um, just like elsewhere, we're in the shoulders and the knees. We've started to use scopes to do more and more because it allows us to do the same thing with the smaller incision. Um, we've started using scopes to do carpal tunnel releases. Now the incision is pretty small in a carpal tunnel release in general. So it's not like we're saving a huge amount of length of incision, but what we do differently is when we do a scope, we can place the incision on the wrist instead of placing it in the palm. And as you might imagine, not having an incision on your palm makes life much easier in terms of being able to use your hand. It means that you don't have to worry about um, rubbing against those stitches using a steering wheel or doing push-ups or riding a bike. Um, and without that incision in your palm, the scar tends to be a little bit softer and go away a little bit more quickly. Um, the other advantage is because the skin's a little bit thinner up in the wrist, uh, you don't need to close it with nylon stitches like you do in the palm. Instead, you can close it with waterproof stitches and skin glue, which means people can start getting their hand wet right away. Um, there are a couple of advantages to that. One, it means we can do both sides at once because you have a hand that you can wash to use the bathroom, things like that. Uh, I personally don't like to do open carpal tunnels on both sides because I like to have people have one hand that they can get wet if they need to. Um, it also may get people back to work a little bit faster with the wound outside of the palm. Uh, it means that you don't have to worry about splitting it. So you can start using your hand for gripping and lifting and twisting right away. Um, for people who are manual laborers, working construction or things like that, this is often something that makes a lot of sense for them. Um, if you want to actually know what that transverse carpal ligament looks like, that's what we're looking at on the left side here. This is the view through one of those scopes. Um, and there's a little a cannula, a little device um, on the right and left side of the screen and on the bottom that's holding the nerves and the tendons out of the way so that we're not at any risk of cutting them, but it's open on the top. And those transverse white fibers that you see, those are actually the fibers of that transverse carpal ligament that forms the roof of the carpal tunnel. This is what it looks like inside the carpal tunnel looking up towards the palm. And the next step of the surgery that we would see here would be to take a little tiny knife and under the guidance of this image that we're seeing on the scope, to use that knife to make a slit all the way from the top to the bottom of the screen. And those fibers will just separate and that releases the transverse carpal ligament. Oop, 
on photos. Um, so surgery is not without risks. There are always risks with anything we do. Um, I don't mean to downplay them by any means in the carpal tunnel world. That being said, this is um, a relatively small surgery. There's no risk of um, significant blood loss during this case. Um, but there are those rare cases where people have some pain that lasts for a little bit of time afterwards. Every once in a while, you run into somebody who for genetic reasons just forms a lot of very thick scar tissue in those cases. Instead of that soreness in the area of the scar lasting for a week or two weeks, it lasts for maybe uh, a month or a little bit longer than that. Um, it's not something that I would recommend stop people from getting the surgery, but it's something to be aware of that some people do have some soreness that can last. And so every once in a while, you'll talk to somebody and they'll say, you know, I did have a carpal tunnel and it was terrible. I, I was sore for a long time. Um, and even in those people, the question to ask them is, once that soreness wore off, was your numbness and tingling better or did it at least stop getting worse? Because that's what we're really going for is trying to prevent this permanent nerve damage from occurring. Um, finally, there are some small percentage of people who have a recurrence. Um, like I said, those leaflets of that transverse carpal ligament will eventually grow back together. And they grow together in an extended position so that the tunnel is a little bit wider once it reforms. That being said, a very, very small percentage of people will have this come back. It usually takes about 10 years or so. And when it does, you can actually repeat the surgery. And people do very well with the repeat surgery as well. Um, in general, this is one of the more satisfying surgeries that we do. The, uh, the numbness and tingling in people who you catch the symptoms early enough in can go away as quickly as the day of surgery. Um, most of the time, it takes a little bit longer. Um, but even within those severe cases, people often say that they sleep better the night afterwards because even if their numbness and tingling still present, some of the sharp shooting pains or discomfort that they have go away. Uh, and the honest truth is that people need their hands. This is a, a surgery that really restores function. Uh, and sometimes people don't realize how much they're missing until it's done. And once the, they're actually finished with the surgery, they realize, oh, you know, I, I didn't realize quite how numb my hands had been or quite how often I was waking up at night. Um, the only other thing I wanna talk about today was cubital tunnel syndrome, which is a very similar thing. If you remember from the very beginning here, we talked about how there are two major nerves that go to the hand. There's the median nerve and the ulnar nerve. And the ulnar nerve is the one um, that we see in blue on the hand here. It goes to the small and half of the ring finger, and that's the funny bone nerve. Um, you can see it up in this um, diagram here that it's the one that travels behind the bone of the elbow there. And you can feel it yourself in that groove behind your elbow. It's the one that when you bang it on a table leg makes your whole hand feel like it's gone dead. Um, and the ulnar nerve, just like the median nerve, does have a tendency to get entrapped and start to malfunction. Um, but the ulnar nerve, when it does so, gives you sensations in the little finger and the ring finger. Um, I see that very often as well. It's maybe not quite as common as carpal tunnel syndrome, but it's a close second. People come with the same sorts of complaints. They say, my finger goes numb. I wake up at night. I feel like I need to shake my hand out. Uh, and the ulnar nerve also controls some muscles in the hand. The muscles that are controlled by the ulnar nerve, instead of being the ones that move the thumb, are the ones that spread and bring the fingers together. And some of the ones that are able to control individual motion of the fingers as well. And so when those start to malfunction, people end up with weakness of their hand, grip weakness, they say the hand feels clumsy or that they have trouble opening um, a shirt with buttons uh, or trouble typing or writing. Um, and the surgery for that is almost exactly the same. The only difference is that instead of making our incision on the palm, we make our incision right behind the elbow here, but we do the exact same thing. We go down and there's a ligament that's lying on top of the nerve there. We simply make a slit in that ligament, it opens up. We close everything up with stitches and people go about their day. The ulnar nerve has similar um, recovery to the median nerve, with the exception that because it's not in your palm, you don't even have to worry about the wound being in a particularly inconvenient place. It's up here. You don't even really think about it unless you're doing something where you're resting your elbow a lot. And even then, the symptoms of the incision go away pretty quickly. Um, that's another surgery that I do very frequently. Uh, we don't usually do that one wide awake just because it's a little bit harder to get the whole area numb. So we do generally give people some sedation for that. 
um, but it's the same sort of procedure and then you go home the same day, you have just a little wound there in the area. And people often come in and have compression at both and get both done on the same day. And that's really all I wanted to talk about. I'll open this up for questions because um, there are a lot of myths that they're floating around carpal tunnel. I imagine somebody will ask about typing and I'm always happy to talk about that. Uh, Melanie, if I can turn it over to you. Sure. Well, thank you, Dr. Tulipin. Um, we do have a few questions that came in. So thank you for covering all this great information. Actually, I have numbness. So I, might be, I might be talking to you in my <laughs> pinky and my ring finger. So <laughs> I'll be seeing you. Um, one of the questions that came in is I've had numbness in my hand for a few years. Is there a specific test that confirms that it's carpal tunnel? And would I need surgery or would I just get the brace first? Um, so there is a test that we do. There are actually a few tests that can be done. Um, my personal preference is for one called the nerve conduction study. Heard that's fine. Uh, the study runs some gentle electrical current through the nerve, um, and it tests to see how many, um, or how much of the signal is getting through. It can test not only whether the signal is getting through more slowly than it ought to be, but also whether the signal is being dampened a little bit. Um, and that tells us not only that carpal tunnel syndrome is present, it also gives us a sense of how severe it is. And one of the nice things about that is it lets us know whether somebody is at imminent risk of permanently losing function or whether this is something that we can safely treat with a brace or with injections. Um, so for that reason, uh, I like to get the nerve conduction study. Um, in people who have mild carpal tunnel syndrome, depending on their symptoms, we'll often just treat it with a brace. And people who have more moderate, severe carpal tunnel syndrome, then we generally talk a little bit more urgently about doing something permanent to fix the carpal tunnel. Okay, awesome, thank you. Uh, why after a steroid injection, do I have to wait three months if I decide to do surgery? Um, so steroids work by suppressing the immune system. Um, the immune system is what is responsible for inflammation in general, but it's also responsible for fighting off infection. Okay. Um, so the steroid is great for providing an anti-inflammatory. It calms down the response of all those immune cells. Your swelling goes down, pain gets better. The downside is without those immune cells functioning normally, you don't have as much ability to fight off infection. And so if you have an area that has steroids present and you do a surgery, um, the immune system is not as able to fight infections at the surgical site and your risk of infection after surgery goes up significantly. Um, and that effect seems to last for about three months. And for that reason, we don't do carpal tunnel uh, if you've had an injection in that area within the last three months. And there are a lot of other surgeries that will be done if you've had an injection in the area. So people don't usually generally do a knee replacement if you've had a knee injection in the last three months. People won't do a shoulder surgery if you've had a shoulder injection in the last three months. And it's all for that same reason. Well, that's good to know. I didn't know that. So thank you. On your, sur on your surgery days, how many carpal tunnel surgeries do you do? I'm trying to think of what the most I've ever done is. Usually, I would say on an average day, I probably do four carpal tunnel surgeries. Okay. Um, and I operate two days a week. Okay. When I was in my training, um, we had our system set up a little bit differently. And we used to do all of our carpal tunnels for the month in one day. And we do them all wide awake, um, the way I was talking, the same way that I, I generally do them. And um, I think the most, but we'd only do carpal tunnels. So no bigger or longer surgeries those days. I think the most we ever did was 20 or 22 in a day. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, once you do a lot of them, they're very efficient. And like I say, if you don't have to wait for people to go to sleep or wait for people to wake up, you can essentially move as quickly as you can do the surgery and clean the room in between patients. Wow, that's a lot. But I know you do, of course, not only carpal tunnel, you do so many other surgeries for hand right. as well. So it was and, just- And I don't, I don't quite run my system that same way like that. Okay. Um, would I need therapy after surgery for carpal tunnel? So most people don't need therapy. Um, you know, therapy is really good in hand surgery for getting rid of stiffness or building up strength. Um, the vast, vast majority of people after carpal tunnel don't have enough stiffness that they really need it. And you don't really lose any strength because we're not cutting any muscles or any tendons or anything like that. The, the weakness and the stiffness that people get is mainly just because they're sore and they're not using their hand as much as they normally would. As long as a person's able to continue moving their hand on their own, and really it's simple exercise, just making a tight fist and straightening them out, 
then I don't generally send people to therapy because it's unnecessary. There are some people who have, for whatever reason, a little bit more stiffness than usual. And those people I will send to therapy, but routinely I find it, it just wastes people's time. Okay. Now, how about therapy before surgery? Um, if you're having stiffness or other things going on with your hand and um, would you find it beneficial for therapy before surgery or? Um, some people do therapy before, carpal, before surgery for carpal tunnel syndrome. There isn't really any good evidence that it helps. Um, there have been a couple of studies on that. And there's no mechanistic reason to think that it would. You know, therapy is great, again, for getting stiff tissues moving. It's great for um, improving strength. But the problem in carpal tunnel syndrome is a physical one. There's just too many square inches of stuff trying to fit through too few square inches of space within that tunnel. And therapy can help with stretching a little bit. It might help with um, uh, bringing down some swelling and potentially improving things some. But in most people, it's not going to fix the problem, which is just that there's there's too much trying to fit through too small a space. Um, so I don't generally prescribe therapy before carpal tunnel surgery. Uh, I'm more likely to prescribe it afterwards if people seem like they need it. Okay. Uh, I have burning and electric sensations in my pointer finger. Is it possible that I have carpal tunnel, tunnel of my finger? I mean, I know it's probably... Kind of so a, that's, that is a, a classic symptom. As a general rule, when people have burning and electric shock type sensations, that, that points to a nerve as the cause. Now, there are, it's possible for other nerve issues to be going on and cause burning or electrical type sensations. Some people, if you've heard of people who have peripheral neuropathy from diabetes or from chemotherapy, that can certainly cause burning or numbness or tingling or electric shock type sensations. Um, you can also have that from compressed nerves in the spine, in addition to compressed nerves at the wrist. But anytime somebody comes into me with electric shock type sensations, my mind immediately goes to thinking about nerves. And certainly the most common reason to have nerve issues in your index finger is carpal tunnel. Okay. Going back to the injection, if you get an injection, can you still get the flu shot or do you have to wait three months for that? Uh, you can still get a flu shot. So the injection has a lot of effects locally. Mm -hmm. but not much of that steroid gets absorbed systemically. So it's not like if you were taking an oral steroid, um, the steroid, it doesn't provide enough of an immune suppression through your whole body to stop you from getting a flu shot. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, where is the surgeries done? Uh, so most of the time it's done at the surgery center. This is kind of the ideal surgery to get done at a surgery center because it doesn't require the resources of a hospital. And that tends to be a much more comfortable and efficient place to get surgery. Um, a couple times a month, I'll, I'll do one at the hospital. And generally that's for people who, for whatever reason, can't get it done at the surgery center. But most of the time this is done at an outpatient center like that. Um, so that people can just go right home afterwards and not have to worry about being in a big city hospital. And going home is the best place. <laughs> so we don't yeah. want to stay in the hospital. The food certainly is better. <laughs> Bring lunch. Dr. Tulipin, we just want to thank you so much for giving us of your time this evening. Um, it, I think it's very valuable information. So many people do have, you know, these symptoms. I know I actually struggle with it myself a little bit. So, um, but you've answered so many questions and I, I think you're giving great insight on this and the syndromes and um, it is very, very helpful. One so, last thing I have to add, because I didn't get the, the, I didn't get the typing question. I feel like I always have to answer that one. Uh, does typing cause carpal tunnel syndrome? Oh. Um, and the answer is, as far as we know, it does not. Um, typing will certainly bother carpal tunnel syndrome if you already have it. Um, the constant motion there, uh, moving those tendons can certainly irritate the nerve, as can resting your hand on something. If you imagine if you have your hand resting on the edge of a keyboard, that's mm -hmm. putting more pressure on that tunnel. But typing doesn't cause carpal tunnel syndrome. It just makes it worse or makes it bother you more if you already have it. The only real job type activities that we know of that cause carpal tunnel syndrome are using tools that vibrate. There's mm -hmm. something about vibration that seems to just drive nerves crazy. Um, and so you can see carpal tunnel syndrome as a result of using power tools. The classic one is jackhammers, that wow. constant hammering over and over into the base of the palm there can cause some scar tissue to build up inside the nerve and cause carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, I see it in carpenters pretty often. Again, they're using drills and nail guns that vibrate. They're constantly banging into the base of their hand. 
Um, but other than that, uh, it is not usually caused um, by the things that people are doing at their job. Yes, it's an old wise tale, right? <laughs> yeah. they, it's, uh, it's probably the most studied thing in all of hand surgery is whether typing causes carpal tunnel syndrome. That's funny. I didn't know that. So, but again, thank you so much for all this great information. Um, any of you that are attending tonight, if you need to make an appointment with Dr. Tulpin, please call us at 1-800-321-9999, or you can always find us on the website, Rothman Orthopedics. Also, you can feel free to email me if any questions were not answered. Um, I'd be happy to relay them to Dr. Tulipin. We'll get back to you in a, in a timely manner with an answer. So it's melanie.ionis at rothmanortho.com. So thank you again, Dr. Tulipin. Thank you all for joining us this, this evening, and we will see you soon. Thank you very much. All right. Have a good night. Take care.